Why does a trader at a London hedge fund and investment bank quit their job and find themselves in Mysore, a small town in southern India, for a month of intensive yoga training? And most importantly, before you think you're on the wrong channel, I bet you're wondering, what does any of this have to do with coffee? Like I said, I spent a majority of my working life in finance. For over a decade, I worked in the powerfully high-octane world of trading floors and markets. So when I decided to part ways with the money, the prestige and credibility for a much slower pace of life and seemingly nothing, my judgment was questioned, to say the least. My world used to be at the forefront of information, where news cycles were counted in seconds and a bathroom break at the wrong time could cost an amount equivalent to the down payment on a reasonably large sized house. When every decision is ultimately gauged on its monetary value, life starts to feel a little purposeless, or at least it did for me. So I did the responsible adult thing and took a nice relaxing vacation by the beach. Um, no, I didn't. I quit and headed off to Mysore, the yoga capital of South India, with Raghunath, who most of you know much better. This brutal one month course with 14 to 15 hour days starting at 5.30 a.m. had me crying by the first week, thinking I'd made the hugest mistake of my life. What happened at the end of this month though, was truly transformational. Without even really noticing when the transition happened, I went from feeling extremely sorry for myself to taking immense joy in being able to hold a posture for five seconds longer, really savored my morning cup of coffee after an hour and a half of yoga and was fully present for the conversations with my classmates during our 30 minute lunch break. My screen time dropped dramatically and I mean sub one hour a day. And often I didn't even know where my phone was. Remember, this is just a few weeks after my entire world was having five screens in front of me and two phones on me at all times. Before I knew it, I wasn't really spending my days trying to get somewhere. I was taking joy in whatever was happening in that moment. So after a month of yoga, we knew that we wanted to incorporate this ethos into whatever work that we did. Thus began Aramse. And to read more about our origin story, check out the links to our blog posts in the description below. Anyone who's followed us from the beginning knows that slowing down and immersing ourselves in the process is at the core of what we do. And right from our in-person workshops at the beginning of Aramse to the content that we now create, we try and share some of that with others. Ways to ritualize something as simple as your coffee brew by engaging all five of your senses. So what are rituals and why should you care? When we think ritual, we often associate it with religious acts, but that's not necessarily the case. And it can be really simple too. Rituals actually have a strong place in our lives to tackle a lot of our day-to-day -day stresses. For all of us tennis junkies in the house, a favorite example of mine, especially given my love for Rafael Nadal, is his wedgie picking pre-serve. This may seem like an outwardly hilarious tick, but everything he does is part of his pre-match routine. He describes it in his memoir as tasks to get him focused, to create order. Research has shown that even simple rituals can help reduce anxiety, increase confidence, and give us a sense of being back in control. For us at Aramse, this has meant stumbling upon the wonderfully therapeutic ritual of coffee brewing. It's helped us combine an existing daily habit with a lot more intentionality and awareness. This means focus, resistance to distractions, and an instant slowing down of time. This has helped us get into what psychology refers to as the flow state. No longer do we need to try and subsequently fail to sit cross-legged for 30 minutes a day and try and meditate. We incorporated meditation into our coffee brewing. Now I know what you're thinking. This is some gimmicky clickbait that sounds too good to be true. Well, here's how we did it. So how do you create a ritual? First, carve out a space. 
Now, having lived in London for about 15 years, I know how precious space can be. But this doesn't need to be an entire room or even an entire section. It could just be a corner on your kitchen counter. So you never really find a loaf of bread or takeout sushi hanging out in that space. When we create rituals, we want to associate it with a particular context. And so the environment really matters. The purpose of this is twofold. First, it acts as a trigger or a reminder for an activity that you want to do. So when you see your coffee station in the morning, it sends a message to your brain that there's an activity that you can now start to do. And second, over time, you'll start to observe that just by looking at or entering the space, it starts to trigger positive associations and feelings. Next, make time. Now that you have a space, set aside a specific time for you to do your chosen activity. With coffee, for most of us that eliminates the evenings and the nighttime. Work with what offers you the least amount of resistance, even if that means just starting out on weekends. Third, eliminate distractions. Let's first talk about the productivity guise of technology. This is a big one. And anyone who's known me knows how obsessed I've been with it for about 10 years now. Now, we're no Luddites. It would be a touch hypocritical given we have a YouTube channel, but we strongly believe in using technology with intentionality. With any ritual, and for the purpose of this video, we talk about coffee, Minimizing distractions is key to getting into the flow state, or what most of us know as being in the zone. It's a state where we're so focused on the task at hand, we become wholly present and achieve a task-oriented meditative state. You enjoy being fully in the moment and forget about the end result entirely. Think about how you feel when your favorite song comes on in the car on the radio and you're singing your heart out. Now, a big obstacle to achieving the state is distractions. And the most obvious distraction that most of us have is Have you ever said to yourself, well, I need my phone to time my brew, to track my flow rate, only to then find yourself quickly scrolling through Instagram, checking out a bunch of tweets, responding to a few WhatsApp messages, just to find yourself super short pressed for time to make that cup of coffee for yourself before your first Zoom meeting of the day. What's amazing is that there's actually really simple things we can do to remedy this. We can trick our minds to stave off distractions by creating small obstacles for ourselves. For example, one, put your phone on airplane mode before you enter your brew space. Two, create a home screen that doesn't allow you to mindlessly check apps that don't serve you most of the time. Think social media. In fact, let the first page of your home screen just have your coffee brewing apps. You'll find this super useful in other aspects of your life too. Just the simple act of having to scroll an extra page to get to your social media apps reduces screen time dramatically. Don't believe me? Try it for a week or two and let me know what happens in the comments below. Three, have a little kitchen timer instead. Or if you're using coffee scales like we do the Akaya, then you have the timer feature built in. You also need to block out the noise, both literally and figuratively. If your kitchen or house is noisy around the time that you're brewing coffee and that prevents you from getting into your coffee brewing headspace, then get a simple pair of earphones and play some music, ideally instrumental, so you aren't accidentally recreating that shower or car karaoke. If your earphones support it, you can even have active noise cancelling on without actually playing any music. If all else fails, just a simple pair of earplugs will do the trick. It's also a great signal to those around you that you aren't really available for conversations at that time. Fourth, have a set of repeatable steps. But before we get into that, here's a really important step you won't have to repeat. Hit the subscribe button and bell icon to stay on top of all of our content. It also really helps us with the YouTube algorithm. So back to repeatable steps. What do we mean by that? Having a mental or even a physical checklist of the same steps you go through each and every time helps you focus, a la Nadal. Here's what we do for pour overs and feel free to use the same routine. In each of these steps though, be mindful or simply put, just observe. Step one, fire up the kettle. Step two, weigh the beans. When you weigh the beans, take a closer look at them. Look at the size and the shape, the color, the color of the chaff in the center cut and any other detail that catches your eye. You can actually learn a lot by just observing. Arabica is more elliptical than the rounder Robusta 
You can get clues about the roast level and even the processing method. Did you know a washed coffee has a more defined center cut with more contrast than a natural? Step three, grind and smell the aroma. We highly recommend hand grinding as it's a truly immersive experience. We're big fans of the Commandante and you can also take a look at our latest review of the Easy Presso J Max, linked up here. Again, with hand grinding, pay attention to the sound and resistance. This will give you a good idea of roast level and bean density. Did you know that the darker the roast, the easier it is to grind? Inhale deeply and let your inner sniffer dog take in the 800 plus aromatics that are released during the grinding process. Shake the grounds and smell. Make notes of little things that you pick out, like fruitiness or memories that are triggered. Here's where making notes actually really helps in order to build both your olfactory vocabulary and also to track progress but more on that a little later. Step four, pre-rinse the paper filter. Step five, brew your recipe of choice. We love Scott Rao or James Hoffman's pour over recipe, but feel free to experiment with what works for you. Also pay attention to that second burst of aromas when hot water hits the coffee bed. Step six, enjoying the fruits of your labor. Really savor the cup of coffee. Notice what's happening from a sensorial point of view. Forget about fancy tasting notes or jargon, and really just focus on the sensations on your palate. First, start with acidity. Does it make the sides of your tongue tingle and salivate? Next, move on to sweetness. This isn't gonna be sugary or saccharine sweetness, but something a lot more subtle. Does it balance out the acidity? Think lime versus green apple. Then, move your attention to body and texture. Does it feel heavy and coat your tongue like whole milk? Or does it feel light like tea? Or is it somewhere in between? Lastly, focus on the aftertaste and how it leaves your mouth feeling once you've swallowed. Does it linger or does it disappear quickly? And was it enjoyable or not? While this may be a little effort initially, you'll soon start to realize how much deeper your appreciation for this fascinating drink can be. And you know what's crazy? You'll also start to see this in other food and drink, elevating your culinary experience as a whole. Step seven, make notes. Now we mentioned this before, but making notes is a great way to track progress when you're developing or fine tuning a skill. You can log streaks, which is great for motivation and keeps you going because it helps you feel a real sense of achievement. Phew, we've covered a lot. But in summary, here are the four main steps. First, carve out a space. Second, make time. Third, eliminate distractions. And fourth, have a set of repeatable steps. Now, I know what you're thinking. And here's how you can shut that little voice in your head that's saying, oh, well, I just don't have the time. Start small. A habit must be established before it gets repeated. This is something that really stuck with me when listening to James Clear talk about his book, Atomic Habits. As an aside, that's a book you should really check out if you get the time. So what does that mean? Simply put, it means start small. If you wanna start doing yoga, start with just rolling out your mat every single day at the exact same time. If you wanna start meditating, start with 50 seconds or just a minute. So how does that translate into coffee brewing? Maybe your goal is to have an entirely manual workflow to brew espresso-based drinks like we showed in our Art of Manual Espresso, linked up here. But the learning curve seems gargantuan. So start small. Start with simple immersion brews like the AeroPress or the French press. Work your way up to more involved and complicated brews. Starting small could also mean just brewing on the weekends. Eventually, you'll be so used to showing up at your coffee station at the exact same time every day that you'll organically work your way up to the manual espresso. Lastly, words matter. The stories we tell ourselves really shape our reality, and so words are powerful. When we think of meditation, we almost certainly don't think of coffee, and it would be a little weird to immediately. What do we think about? We think serene environment, sitting cross-legged. You catch my drift. And what comes to mind when we think of coffee? For a lot of us, it's kickstarting our day or a caffeine boost. So why do we think of a serene environment when we think of meditation? It's because that environment makes us feel a certain way. But what if I told you you could recreate that same feeling by telling yourself a slightly different story? I'm one of those people that's gone to bed at night looking forward to drinking their morning cup of coffee for as long as I can remember. And if you're like that too, 
It can actually be really hard to find the motivation to go through an elaborate bunch of steps to finally get to that joyous stage of drinking that deliciousness. But if we start to see it a little differently and tell ourselves that the joy begins right from weighing out the beans, even if you don't believe it instantly, over time you'll discover that you find the entire process enjoyable. Your coffee brewing is no longer a means to an end, it's pleasurable in and of itself. So that's it. It's really that simple. This isn't a 7, 21, or 30 day challenge. It's a new way to think about your days. It's been a while since I've been in front of the camera, and so for most of you watching, I'm actually a new face. It does feel good to be back though, after six months of being knee deep in diapers and covered in spit up. So we thought we'd take a little break from product reviews and workflows to share with you some of the other things that occupy our time and that we focus on. We really hope you enjoyed it and we'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Tell us about rituals that you have, coffee or otherwise. Did you find this content useful? And are there ways that we can help you ritualize your brew? Let us know and we'll be sure to respond. If you've made it this far in the video, thanks for sticking around. As always, a massive thank you to our Patreon supporters and to our YouTube subscribers. Until next time, brew aram se.